when drugs were prevalent, you, you weren't participating in that, then it, it went away. And I'm assuming they started drug testing everyone. You couldn't do it anymore. I'm assuming, right? Like were the other 38 year olds that you were playing with 10 years early before this all went down, were they all doing steroids to keep themselves around? I have never seen anyone in the locker room inject steroids. So, uh, I'm not sure uh, what these other guys were doing. A lot of the guys were just retiring. Yep. But uh, yeah. as I mentioned, a lot of the guys who aren't in a Hall of Fame never tested positive mm -hmm. uh, for steroids. Good but point. it's very unfortunate uh, because we have some of the greatest who have ever played who may not make the Hall of Fame. And you can throw Roger Clemens, seven Cy Young. You know, he never tested positive. It's just from what somebody said. <laughs> All right. Well, we've had some NFL stars from the past and the present. You know, Roddy White, Austin Eckler. Recently, we had Scott Williams on from the Chicago Bulls 90s teams telling some good Michael Jordan stories. Randy Couture from the freaking UFC and OG. And, uh, you know, this is a business podcast. We've managed in all of these episodes to bring it back to 2000% raise and what that means to you and elevating yourself, leveling up. Okay. Well, I got to tell you guys, I, I feel like I'm leveling up as, as a podcast host. And, and the reason behind that is because of who's who today's guest is, you know, I came out of the gates early and, you know, the Tracy Tudor was one of my bigger names that I had. I had Darren Rovell and, you know, I had some good people, but these were favors. They, they, they were in my network. I, I, I was friends with these people. Today's guest, I, I haven't known him. And, and I got to tell you, we, we were connected through a mutual friend. And uh, he did a little research and, and agreed to be on this. And uh, it, it is a feather in my motherfucking cap, everybody. So I'm very happy about this. <laughs> And Johnny, I, I'm gonna make a joke real quick here. I, I don't want you to hang up on me before the interview, but but I contemplated before I give this introduction. I contemplated introducing him as a reality TV star. Okay, <laughs> not 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 to an MLB legend, a reality TV star that's been on Below Deck, MTV Cribs, Dancing with the Stars. He he's hosted Raw, WWE Raw, and he's been on The Apprentice. I mean, uh, did I miss any, John? Um, yeah, you forgot the show Taint. Oh, okay. And that's, yeah, that's when we had a baby reveal from, uh, you know, our boy Dash, who was a vasectomy baby. And uh, that was a very good show working with those guys <laughs> as well. So so off camera before we started this, everybody, I, I had, a, we're, we're talking about our kids and uh, he, he spanned between six years and uh, 24 four years old for his kids. And I go, whoa, that's quite the stretch. And he goes, yeah, I had a vasectomy when I had the six year old. <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah so i have two now <laughs> exactly so, did you go to the same doctor though i did because it was a uh free charge the second time <laughs> gotcha gotcha well hey listen so uh, everybody if you haven't realized it yet or seen it in the show notes uh my guest today is johnny damon and for those of you that are living in a cave i'll, I'll give you a a quick, a quick rundown. There's, there's so much you could say about John, but um, he's an, a, a major league baseball star, one of the best ever play, in, in my opinion. And he's one of the most outstanding, respected, and durable players in the history of major league baseball. He spent six years in Kansas City. He was on the A's and the Red Sox. And after winning the 2004 World Series with the Boston Red Sox, and became a legend there in New England. Kind of there it is. Oh, look at that ring. Anyone watch it on YouTube? He just flashed the ring up. Boom. Boom. Uh, he kind of shocked the world. And I'm gonna let him tell that story. Cause I'm I'm sure no one's ever asked you about this before, John. Uh, after winning the World Series, then jumping ship to their rivals over in New York on the Yankees, where he then a few years later helped them win a World Series. So I I I, I have a lot of questions about that, my friend. Oh, and there's the Yankees ring, exactly. <laughs> There's a lot to say here, here about John, but I, but I'll also mention you know there's the Johnny da Damon uh, Foundation. It's a it's a five hundred one c three. They raise money and then donate it to other charitable funds. And and anyone that hasn't been paying attention, you know, and and he's a father of eight. By the way, we're just talking about his kids. 
you know, if, if you haven't been paying attention, he, he's got a lot of personality. He's got a lot of, a lot of personality. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this interview today. Johnny Damon, welcome to 2000% Raise. Thank you for having me and looking forward to it. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, one of the things we do on our show is talk a lot about um, movies and, and usually from a financial standpoint. I, I end the show with asking people about what their favorite movie is. And one of my favorite movies is the movie Moneyball. Let's start there. People that don't know, it's about how the Oakland A's and, and Major League Baseball doesn't have salary caps. Okay. So, so it's about Brad Pitt plays um, whatever his name is. But what's his name? Billy Bean. Billy Bean. Billy Bean. Exactly. One of my favorite freaking movies for, as far as sports movies are concerned. And Jonah Hill's in it. And they turned the A's around with, with limited resources. And, and the movie starts with how their superstar left them. Johnny Damon and called Giambi, I think, as well. Or guys that ju yep. that jumped ship, and no one ever made. They weren't making Johnny look bad or anything. That they just couldn't compete. He was getting seven million dollars plus to go over to Boston, and they didn't have the budget in Oakland. All right, Johnny, is, is the way that movie laid out? Is is this a real? Is this a real problem? Because as you sit there and watch this, you'd think that the Yankees and the Red Soxes of the world could just sit around and bully everybody. There should be a salary cap like every other fucking sport. Correct. Uh, yeah, I think the movie was done very well. I mean, there's not too many shows that uh, Jonah Hill or even the super great Brad Pitt, uh, you know, they show up for every movie um, and they did a great job. Unfortunately, like the Moneyball movie, it pretty much got me out of the game in 2012. Yeah, I'm getting older. I'm 38 years old. Teams start to say, well, we can bring in these young guys that we don't have to pay too much. And these guys can play three different positions. We will have a fresh team um, all the time. And so it pretty much, yeah, did open up GM's eyes and say, you know what? If we can stay young as long as possible. And it's kind of like the Premier League. I mean, they're calling up 16-year-old kids because they know they can run all day. They know... There's a, a lot of talent, and uh, so yeah, it was a it was a great movie. But what everybody forgets about it is you had three stud pitchers. You you had uh, Mulder, Tim Hudson, and you also had Barry Zito, who weren't uh, getting big money either. So those three guys were the top ten pitchers in the league every year they were there. Oh, so they can just go out there and. I'll get the job done, but uh, and how, I think they did. A, how were they able to keep them on the team? Were they were they just under short contracts or what? Yeah, the, these guys just came out of college, so they were uh, being being paid the minimum. I'm not sure when they got a contract. They may have um, signed a contract to uh, um, ins ensure their future and uh, took a uh, home team discount. But uh, those guys were so good and. But uh, I think they did a great job. I mean, they got uh, Scott Hatterberg from the Red Sox, who was always a tough at bat. Um, Frank Manichino, my yeah. So just a great team. And unfortunately, the year before, uh, Jason Giambi got a great deal with the uh, Yankees. Yep. I got a great deal with the uh, Red Sox. Yep. I actually thought I was going to the Yankees before they signed mm -hmm. uh, Rondell White. And uh, Jason Israelhausen went back home to St. Louis. Got it. Got it. And I'll just refresh our audience here for those that haven't seen it. it, it it's, it's powerful what you just said, that the concept of Moneyball ended your career, you know, a decade later. And, and, and here, here's why it's interesting, everyone, because Jonah Hill's character working with Brad Pitt, they changed the way they're evaluating players. It's not just about hits and RBIs. It's getting your ass on base. And, and gosh, Johnny, I would I would have thought – that there was a lot of Hollywood dramatization in that. But but if you're saying it was ending people like yours career because of that evaluation process, I mean, that's real shit. Well, well, obviously, if I would have been doing a lot better, yeah. I would have um, kept my job. But but I had a really good year in Tampa Bay in 2011, helped them get to the playoffs. And I couldn't get a job the next year until May 1st. So if you think about it, I'm 10 weeks late for the season. I'm hanging out with the boys on the golf course and then, I get a call from Cleveland saying, uh, we only need you for a couple weeks. And here I am going, huh, what's a couple weeks? Oh, why don't I uh, train a little bit, uh, say bye to my friends, and uh, head out to Arizona, uh, work out with the guys, and then meet them. Holy shit. And, and I just wasn't ready. You yep. know, it was uh, when you don't see live pitching for 
I mean, it, ha- it had to be six months after the um, 2011 season till May 1st. So think about it. Yep. It's hard to do. Yeah. I can go out there and hit very well now, but I also need to go practice and do stuff. So when I was playing with Savannah Bananas, I mean, I'm going up um, without taking batting practice, without taking uh, um, swings and just going up and hitting and holding my own for an almost 50-year-old. But uh, um, the swings there, you know, it's the endurance and the legs that you need to build up to be ready to play a game. Like I play soccer, which has kept me in shape. Okay. But uh, um, playing a major league baseball game, I can't do it. At least in soccer, I can sub out and <laughs> – yep. and Catch my breath. Yeah. I got to tell you, man, you, you know, you're reminding me because J- Johnny's actually in a hotel room in Vegas right now. It looks like you got a pretty good one there, too, with the high, ce- high ceilings. Um, a, a guy I almost did business with a couple of years ago, one of your um, your colleagues in baseball, who, who, we're not really friends, but I spent some time with him, is uh, Ho- Jose Canseco, um, lives about a mile from where you're sitting right now in, in, uh, okay. in Henderson. Yeah. And uh, we, we'd, we'd talk a lot about just like the game today versus versus then and and i'm not going to share any personal information or something but you, you'd, you'd think a guy like jose canseco as as famous as he was or the heyday he had that he'd be sitting on these piles and piles of 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 money and he's fine he's fine but it's not you know maybe not like what you might expect you know what i mean and then he played, right you know one of the points he made he goes shit you think mike trout's gonna have to worry about fucking money ever in his freaking life you know no and I'd, I'd really be curious of your opinion, Johnny, you know, what, what was your, cause you were one of the highest paid guys at the time in baseball, but it was nothing close to what got, like it wasn't 400 fucking million dollars like trout got right. Like, right. like what's your right. comments on this? Right. Yeah. Thanks to the guys before us, you know, like myself for the guys like Mike Trout, but, um, like, um, Mr. Flood, I mean, he started the free agency and, and, I think it's great. These guys are getting paid a lot of money, but uh, um, back to the Jose Canseco. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing when you speak the truth how you get blackballed, and that's that's in society. I mean, that's in politics. Like you, you speak the truth, you're um, they're coming after you because people want to understand their own truth. And I had a great conversation with him probably six months ago, and I I, I just said, you know, what you did, you did. You spoke the truth. You can't. I'm not upset with you. I mean, I'm a guy who ne- who never did. And you know, the guys who did at the end of my career, they got a slap on the wrist, and then they got a four year contract because they said they care so much about playing well, about winning, that they're willing to take whatever they can so they can continue to play. And here I am sitting, going, "Wow!" But I've got nothing against these guys. Like, um, what what's amazing is guys like. Barry Bonds, the greatest player who ever stepped on the field, never tested positive, and he's not in the Hall of Fame. And obviously, we know what Pete Rose did, the most hits in history. He's not in the Hall of Fame. But, yeah, Conseco, you would think it would be rolling in some cash, but um, our, U- our union did a great job. Like, when I was leaving Boston, I never wanted to leave Boston. Um, but guess what? I was the only – Boston was the only team I could talk to for six weeks after the season – I had zero offers from Boston and New York had to get going. The offer from Boston came a couple of days after I agreed with the Yankees. You know, they offered me four years, $40 million, sending it in a DHL package to my house when I already agreed to a four-year 52 with the Yankees. Well, oh. what that did, like Kenny Lofton was the uh, benchmark for center fielder. So that's, and he was at $8 million, and that's what I ended up signing with the Red Sox. So if I don't go to the Yankees, salaries can possibly stay down. Obviously, um, you're going to overpay for some guys, but I brought the uh, salary from $8 million to $13 million for center fielders. Holy so, shit. And then, and then guys like Torrey Hunter came a little bit after me and raised the ceiling again. Dude, that's uh that's an awesome story, man. I I had no idea that and you're saying if you wouldn't have went to the Yankees, probably never would have freaking happened. Well, it eventually it would have happened, but I definitely helped um players association by going to New York and I I'm an East Coast guy too. I I didn't want to head out west. I I wanted to be in the line limelight. 
I wanted baseball to be important every single night. And it sure was with the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it ties back to what we're saying, right? You, you, you throw out these numbers and you go from there to what, what you know, um, Trout's getting paid. And it's like, yeah, hey, I don't think Oakland uh, Oakland's uh, population has uh, quadrupled in the last 20 years. Or they probably have the same freaking struggles. And the, that, that, that top bar just keeps going up and up, you know, and it's kind of kind of messed up, right? Yeah, and that that's why they're moving right behind me in Vegas. So uh, Oakland had, had, had to get out. Like, I love playing for the A's, and it's unfortunate for the fans uh, because they can't figure um, it out. The politicians can't figure out where the money's coming from because we know California spends a lot of money. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you what, man. I want to clarify one thing just when we were talking about Conseco a little bit. Nicest guy in the world to me. I stayed at the house yeah. a couple of days, and I, I just want to make sure everybody realizes that he's definitely not on the street corner a- asking for change. Okay, this guy has a no, beautiful no. house in a gated community, <laughs> into the seven figures. I don't know this, but I'm guessing it would be a seven figures as a nice ass purebred dog, and he's a really really good dude. The the context of me in this conversation is he was looking for putting together. He, he invents things that he was looking for. Uh, you know, raising some capital for what he was trying to do. We ended up not working together on it because um, I'm a venture capitalist. But uh, my first question was, oh, just, just raise it, do it yourself. He goes, ah, we, we're not getting paid trout money back then. Yeah, and a lot of people uh, trying to stay away from him. But he's a great guy. He's, you know, he made a promise to his mom to be the very best baseball player in the world. Yep. And he did 40-40. And, yeah, I saw the documentary and I was blown away. So I... I like Jose, you yeah. know, unfortunately, uh, um, he sent ripples through major league baseball, but yeah. it had to happen. Dude, it was going to happen. If it wasn't him, it would have happened. Somebody would have like, like, yeah. right. and everybody, what he's talking about is, is this is the early two thousands, right? Johnny was, this was the beginning yeah. of your career. So Ho- Jose Canseco's yeah. coming out talking, everyone's doing steroids and they brought him in front of, I mean, it was almost the end of major league baseball, almost like, almost like the WWE had to deal with it at one point too. Like it's like a conspiracy right. where everybody in the system is doing drugs, like a, like a syndicate or something. Right. You know, I mean, it, right. it was literally yeah. almost over. And so he, uh, he got black, black ball. Well, he did. I don't know. If you look at his old interviews, he said some shit about Mark McGuire that I can't tell if it's true or not. I don't know if they actually just keep your well, shots in the ass, like I said, but anyway, well, he, he wanted to keep hitting home runs. He wanted to get to 500 and, you know, milestones are huge. Like at the end of my career, I mean, I, I wanted to keep playing because I, I was at almost 2,800 hits. Of course I wanted to get to 3000, mm-hmm. but I wanted to get to 600 doubles. I wanted to get to 1800 runs. Like I think right now I'm maybe 20th career run score. And I wanted to jump into that top 10. Yep. So, but unfortunately my age, my, my numbers were good in Tampa. You know, I had 80 runs scored, 70 RBIs, and couldn't get a job. So, yeah. you know, it, it happens. Well, well, and then let's tie that back to what we were just talking about with Conseco, right? So, so, so you were in the league before the, w- when drugs were prevalent. You, you weren't participating in that. Then it, it went away, and I'm assuming they started drug testing everyone. You couldn't do it anymore, I'm assuming, right? Like, like were, were, were the other 38-year-olds that you were playing with 10 years early before this all went down, were they all doing steroids to keep themselves around? I have never seen anyone in the locker room inject steroids. Well, unless you talk about cortisone shots for your arm or your elbow or your knee. Um, I personally personally never saw it. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what these other guys were doing. A lot of the guys were just retiring. Yep. But uh, yeah. as I mentioned, a lot of the guys who aren't in a Hall of Fame never tested positive mm-hmm. um, for steroids. Good but, point. you know, the, the media – threw it out there yeah. and you know it's very unfortunate uh, because we have some of the greatest who have ever played who may not make the hall of fame and you can throw roger clemens seven side young you know, yeah yeah he never chance to positive it's just from what somebody said There's, i want everyone to really pay attention to what he just said there okay and i, I i've experienced this this firsthand I, I played football at notre dame i never saw one guy at notre dame do steroids i'm not saying that they weren't, but I could swear to God, I never saw one person do steroids there. And I don't know of anybody either that, that was doing it. And, but you talk to the general public, oh, bullshit, oh, fuck it. We were all doing it steroids. We played at Illinois state or whatever. Listen, I swear to God, I never, I never saw it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's right how the world works. 
Hey everybody, I want to invite you to check out 2000%Raise.com. Here you could buy the 2000% Raise book, also available on Amazon. You could check out 2000% Raise merchandise, as well as 2000% Raise special events that might be coming to your city soon. Last but not least, you can enroll in the 2000% Raise curriculum, which will help you on your entrepreneurial journey. Don't forget to follow at John Sarasani on Instagram and TikTok as well. Thank you for being a supporter of the show. Hey, man. So <laughs> let, let, I want to ask you one more question about baseball before we move on. And we are going to talk about Below Deck. I, I know all these reality TV fans are tuning in today, this week for, for the, the Below Deck episode. But it, in, in the 2003 American Le uh, League Division Series, Johnny had a collision. All right. And I'm surprised. I'm shocked this shit doesn't happen more in, in baseball. With one of his own teammates, uh, I believe his name was Damian Jackson, and yeah. go YouTube that shit, and they show it in slow oh. motion. I, I gotta tell you, when they replayed that thing, it's it's head to head with both of them looking up, running full speed into each other, and yet you watch it. You got two experienced players. One, neither of you called for the ball. I'm assuming. I'm, assu I'm assuming, but but Johnny got knocked out cold. Could you, could you tell us about that? Yeah. So Damian Jackson just came into the game for defensive purposes, and and I had a short, easy fly ball to center field, which I really don't have to call for because I I'm always there. And <laughs> there's there, there's a great sports science on that co collision, but man, that that tore me up. I mean, I, I was on the ground for five minutes. They, uh, ambulanced me out and I actually thought I was walking out and waving to the fans wow. because I played in Oakland two years prior. So I get to the, uh, um, hospital and I see this friend of mine wearing this shirt. It said 2003 Red Sox versus the A's. And I'm thinking it's 2001. And I'm like, What's going on? So I, I was thrown in a loop. And of course, I remember my wife, Michelle, uh, girlfriend at the time. And I was like, what's going on? So I kept asking the same question. And, you know, we had a great Boston owner who uh, flew me back to Fenway the following day because the team just clinched. And this is what I played for, you know, yeah. seeing George Britt hoist a trophy in 1985 made me want to play baseball. So I was like, this is playoff time. I've got to be ready to play. And I wouldn't take batting practice. I wouldn't go shag. I would just run onto the field. And first inning, I was just wiped out because of the concussion. Okay. Um, took its toll on me. And I was like, man, I got to fight through it. I got to fight through it. And unfortunately, I really couldn't move. And we lost uh, in game seven on the Aaron Boone home run. And I left for the off season and I pretty much just chilled, did nothing, slept a lot. The hair grew. And once uh, it, it was February, I was like, oh man, I've got spring training in two weeks. So I started going out, racing these cars because it was a 25 mile per hour zone. So I would wait for these cars and kind of get myself going. And, and I was a, tra I was a track star as well. So uh, I could hold my own, but, uh, that's how I trained for that year. And, you know, I show up to the spring training, walk in like a minute late because all these reporters are talking to me and I walk in and Theo Epstein sees me and he's like, whatever you do, do not cut your hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we went the whole season, um, you know, had that miraculous three Oh comeback on the Yankees nice. won the world series. I mean, after wow. 86 years, I mean, we created a lot of joy for, uh, uh, Red Sox Nation, and I'll show it one more yeah, time. It was the Boston Ring, baby. Boom. Yeah. Boom. That's a first of four. Yeah. Um, in the century. Incredible, man. That's incredible. You know, so so it, it's hilarious hearing you tell that story. You, you, it, do, do I sense some? So would you guys have won it in 03 if, if, if yeah. Damian knew not to run, run out to uh, outfield? And, I, and I'm assuming you're, one, you're yeah. obviously the star of the team or one of the star. You're probably the star, right? And, and I'm, I'm assuming yeah. Damien was not. Did he? Uh, was, was that a problem in right. the locker room? Well, at the time, I was one of the hottest hitters in the postseason, and and I could get very streaky out there. And I was like 
hitting everything. And yeah, I feel like we have a strong chance. I know the uh, Marlins ended up going to the World Series um, and they added a lot of key components like Pudge Rodriguez. I know Jeff Conan was there, um, brought up Don Tro Willis, uh, Josh Beckett. And we had our way with the uh, Marlins during that season and they bolstered up and who knows if we would have beat them. Yep. But I it definitely would have been great to be in the World Series. You know, what did what did the rest of I, I why am I picturing Damian Jackson to be like Steve Bartman in Chicago? Like he never <laughs> showed his face in Chicago again. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I love Damian. He was such a great teammate and unfortunately they let him go after the season. Mm. Hope, hopefully it was for him to go to a, a better place where he can play more. Yeah. But uh it I mean, I had to go to the chiropractor for the next year probably two or three times a a week because i kept getting headaches i mean it just didn't go away so i i did what i had to do so i can um, get get out on the field but yeah it it was devastating for sure you can't touch johnny damon i don't care if it's a game or a (laughs) practice it's it's like in high school football my dad was my coach anybody that comes near the quarterback will get kicked out of practice don't be within five feet (laughs) just let it fall to the ground uh, well, thanks for sharing that, brother. Hey, I want to ask you a couple quick things before we, then we're going to get into the bl- below deck stuff. But uh, you, you serve on one of the count or served on one of the councils of, of uh, Donald Trump. You spoke at one of his rallies um, back in uh, 2016. How about a little foreshadowing here, man? Are you are you still a supporter? Are you involved in this next run? Um, share that with the audience. Yeah, we're not sure how much involvement I'm going to be in the next run. Okay. Um, and Donald's been a friend of mine for 18 years, mm-hmm. so I always support my friends. And cool. especially, uh, you know, Donald comes out and talks. You know, um, one side thinks he doesn't tell the truth, but I haven't seen the guy lie once to yep. me. And uh, yeah, and and he's he's real, yep. and he'll answer questions. Yeah, and if he if he's wrong, he'll uh, raise his hand. But uh, um. The guy we have now just really doesn't talk and he's just not there. So, um, and unfortunately our vice president, like what I want is, you know, I'll be okay with Biden and Kamala if they just did their job, yeah. if they, if they took care of the American people, because we're taking care of other countries more than we're taking care of our veterans, more than we're taking care of our homeless, more than, um, uh, like that disaster that happened in, uh, Ohio, like what, took for, forever and they never told people to put on the mask when there's uh chemicals in the sky in the water but they tell us to put a mask on um during the entire uh pandemic so it's uh it's kind of it's kind of strange it's ass backwards is uh, what i'm just trying to say and obviously uh DeSantis has been a great governor in florida and florida has had great governors through the years from martinez to uh oh shoot i'm sorry um to jeb bush yep. i mean We've had great governors, so uh, and that's why Florida is rocking and rolling like we are. Awesome, we are great. And what part of Florida are you in? I'm in Orlando. Cool. I've nice. been there for 43 years awesome. since my dad retired from the army, cool. and uh, I was six years old. So uh, got the big five zero this year. So we're getting ready to plan a uh, absolute mayhem party. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, and, and it's going to be a good week too. Okay. Well, well, well uh, I won't say the name, but but me and Johnny have a uh, mutual friend in between us, and me and him are attached by the hip sometimes. So so if he gets invited, I might be his plus one. All right, buddy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to have a blast. So you are definitely invited. Awesome. I'll extend that to you right awesome, now. Awesome, man. I appreciate that. Um, so you know, you, you, Michael Jordan, bro, famously said, okay, when, when he was getting pressure to to kind of pick a side with political and social issues. He famously said, you know, both sides, both sides buy shoes. I I ain't getting in the middle of this. And, you know, with LeBron James right now, even everything you're talking about right now, I I don't care which side you're on. That's not what I'm talking about. Right. But do you, do you think that there's just more and more athletes and, and Johnny, you kind of showed your cards already, right? You, you've, you've chosen to live in Florida. We obviously know you're involved with with Trump and you, you just said your opinion on it, but but what do you think about professional athletes like right now, especially the high profile ones like LeBron being so outspoken where the Michael Jordans of the world were never? Yeah, well, LeBron has his opinion. I'm not going to tell them to think another way, but the uh, 
um, the left wants us to all be alike and we just aren't. Like if I like steak and someone likes uh, vegetables more, I mean, that's okay. We're okay to be different. We're, we're all human beings. And I actually grew up in a democratic household and have voted Democrat in the past. It's just has changed. And, you know, like I said, LeBron can say what he wants. He's arguably one of the best that's ever played the game. And um, I think our politicians need to do something about what's going on on the south side of Chicago, what's going on in a bunch of areas. Just do something because there's a lot of people who are struggling, the drug crisis, the border crisis. There's so much. There's so many wars going on, and we really don't know. Like, none of this was happening under the last administration. And Donald Trump was actually a Democrat. He just uh, – he he changed parties. He knew Hillary was going to be tough to beat uh, on the Democratic line, but he kept, he stayed in the middle. And like I said, I support my friends. I support people's uh, thoughts. And uh, that's why we're individuals and we can think for ourselves. Unfortunately, our government is trying to make us think the same. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, man, not to get too too much on the politics, but I feel like if Biden's uh, son wouldn't have passed away and he would have actually run, I feel like he might have beaten Hillary in the in the uh, primaries. And I think Trump would have had a, hard, a lot harder time beating, beating Biden back then than uh, than Hillary. I, I think they really underestimated how many people just just don't like her. It's like, it's almost like how people don't like yeah, Trump. Right. They, they don't like Trump. They can't say why they just don't like her. I, I think a lot I think a lot of people say the same about Hillary. Well, for me, it's all about policy. If Trump's policies were awful, I would think about voting for someone else. But his policies are spot on. He's a businessman. And think about the uh, group of um, presidents we've had, had in. They were all lawyers. So lawyers think they're right all the time. And they're not going to budge. And Trump's a businessman. Um, Reagan was a businessman. Bush was a businessman. And, and yeah. There, there's a there's a lot more that goes into it, but uh, uh, it's going to be interesting. And think about it. People loved Trump back in the day. Like they would have him on movies. They would have him on all kinds of shows. And uh, like I said, you don't have to like him. Policies are number one. And our policies in our country right now are the worst. And other countries are laughing at us. Other countries are taking advantage of us. And we can't have that. Yeah. I can't, you're not going to get an argument out of me on on that one, my friend. Um, hey, back, back to baseball briefly. You know, I didn't realize that incident with Damien was actually against Oakland. Okay, so so Oakland, Oakland yeah. went that far even when they lost you because, because of what we just talked about, money, money ball, right? Yeah, um, right. Were you, I, I, I got to think, now tell me if I'm hypothesizing this wrong, and I know you're probably going to say something politically correct in terms of the fan base is not politically correct in terms of politics right. as far as Boston or New right. York, I'm sure you're going to say, but, but I got to think a lot of Boston people weren't too happy with you when, when you left to go to go to the Yankees. Um, how about the Oakland fans? Were, were, were they, when, when, when you were down, knocked out, were, were they kind of like, let them stay down? <laughs> uh, no, you know, the Oakland fans treated me well okay. and all my fans throughout my career treated me well because I went out there um, I played hard and I hustled yeah. and I was accountable. So if I messed up, I'm not running from the media, um, taking the questions and, you know, I should have got a hit in that situation. I should have made the play. So, uh, unfortunately a lot of accountability is not, not around. But they weren't pissed at you for leaving for Boston and not sticking around. Well, I know they wanted me to, to stay, yeah. but they also knew that I was a East coast guy and I had some young kids that, yeah. Um, you know, that six, seven hour plane ride to go home on off days right. or for them to come see me would have been tough. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, so, so, so now here we are years later here, you, you walk, you're walking around in, uh, the North end in Boston. Are people high-fiving you or flicking you off? Um, nowadays it's a lot better. There were definitely a lot of people upset and I, I understand. I mean, I was a fan favorite there and. Unfortunately, when you don't have a contract offer, you need to go somewhere. Unfortunately, it was their arch enemy. Like I was thinking about signing with Detroit. They just lost 120 games. Spring training was in Lakeland, right down the road from me. 
And I, I knew they were close, but they said, we would love to have you, but we have a young kid named Curtis Granderson that we're giving a shot this year to. So then I called the uh, Dodgers and they spent some money on Rafael for a call. They said they didn't have any more money. And then uh, the Yankees were the only team. So it was tough. Yeah. I, at the time, I didn't want to go. I wanted Boston to show that they cared. They wanted me. And I started talking to Brian Cashman and we struck a deal. And right. he said, think about it. I know Boston meant a lot for you. And tell, tell me tomorrow sleep on it. Yep. Five minutes later, it's in the media. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy. And and my wife and I were in Jacksonville buying a puppy. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, and the news broke out and all of a sudden my phone starts ringing yep. off the hook. <laughs> well, and that's like, we, we've talked about this on the on the show with some NFL guys that the, the importance in the NFL of getting to your second contract. And I don't think it's quite as meaningful in, in baseball you could get paid from day one I think in baseball but but for you in that yeah. situation your salary went from x to triple that right in one one phone call right yeah yeah it went from eight to 13 a year okay and like I said I think Boston eventually would have probably offered me um maybe four year 10 but if they're the only team that needs a leadoff hitter and center fielder they could just go go offer me a one-year contract with five million I mean it it's happened to a lot of players in the past where you have no place to go. And then I would have been leaving a lot on the table and hoping for another great year because I had to pull out of Lloyd's of London um, insurance policy the last month of the uh, 2005 season. So in case I did get hurt, and that's when I told Boston, there's no more hometown discount because they, after we won the World Series, they told me to buy a house. I'm going to be there for a long time. So I buy a house. They said they were going to offer me a contract in spring training that never happened. Wow. And so so I had another great year. And at the end of it, they knew they had Jacob um Jacoby Ellsbury coming a year after I departed. So and that worked out great for them. It worked out great for both teams. Yep. And uh and so it was a great move. You know, it's so messed up though, man, versus other sports. Because if Boston, you could spend whatever the f you want, right? There is no, there's no caps yeah. on anything, right? Either the player right. salary or the team salaries. They give you whatever the hell they want if they want to, right? Yeah. So the uh, following year, they ended up spending like two hundred and fifty million dollars on a number of um, players, including Dice K. So, and then they end up winning the World Series, and that's the worst feeling in the world when you leave a team. Well, the first year I'm with the. Yankees, the Red Sox finished in fourth place. Uh, they had some injuries down, and as the Yankees went to the playoffs, I had an incredible year, and um, yeah, kind of showed them that you need to spend money on the quality of players, including the clubhouse aspect of it, because I was great in the clubhouse to all these guys, all these young guys coming up with the veterans, and unfortunately, that doesn't show up on a contract. Yeah, and It doesn't show up on the uh, wins above replacement mm -hmm. and it doesn't show up on a lot of places. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I, and I got to think an NFL guy we had on here before he, he had he balled out on the Colts and it was free agent and ended up going to the giants for 40 million over four years. He was not a, as big of a superstar like you or anything, but, but he couldn't stay on the Colts cause they already had a big time linebacker there. So he knew when he was a free agent, they couldn't afford him because there's only so much money that they're going to put towards linebackers. Whereas right. in baseball, there's no limitations. They could do whatever the hell they want. So, so Bobby O'Karake, when I asked him about this, he goes, he can't take a personal, it's a business. What percentage are they going to put in the linebacker pool? It's going to, it's going to sacrifice somewhere else. But, but, but to you, it's like, you, you gotta, no, you, they're telling you, you ain't the guy, you ain't the guy. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. And, yeah. and I believe, I believe I was 31 at the time. So mm -hmm. what the Red Sox is doing, they're looking into money ball. They're saying, okay, so we'll have Johnny Damon as a center fielder at 32, 33, 34. You normally start um, losing a little bit of your speed, a little bit of whatever. So that's what they're looking at. And that's what all these teams are looking at. So, and that's how they um, evaluate running backs. I mean, look at Saquon Barkley, like one of the best out there and he may have to find another home or maybe they resigned him already. But, uh, yeah, Ezekiel Elliott, you know, a, yep. a favorite with the Cowboys. He's 
he's looking for another home. It's uh, Dude, it's a tough business. Yeah, running backs don't get paid, man. John, John no. Taylor's on his last contract right now. He he last year was guy. He can't even get a freaking extension. <laughs> Jonathan Taylor's right. a badass. That's crazy. Right. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's tough, and those are tough guys out there. And yeah, um, yeah, tough contracts to get. All right, man. So so let's talk about it. By the way, I just made a note to myself. I do want to shout out. Uh, Johnny brought up Curtis Granderson, the University of Illinois, Chicago baseball field bears his name. I have some friends that are friends with Curtis that I uh, hung out with in the city for a while. Overall, great dude. All accounts of him have been overall great dude. Yep. All right, man. How, how, how did you, I'm, I'm going to tell everybody how I got on below deck. Uh, I'll tell my story really quick. No, nobody's calling me, buddy. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking they're probably scouting you out, but maybe not. I, I, listen, I have a friend of mine whose family is the home head office of a, of an NBA team and we're friends. And she says to me, they ask us to be on this fucking thing every year. We're, there's no way we're going to do it. And I, his, her dad's the president of the damn organization. It ain't happening. And she goes, but hey, she forwards me the email, the casting director. She goes, this might be up your alley. I go, that it is. That it is, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it kind of worked out for me because here's the thing with Below Deck, everybody. It, it, it's not that hard to get on the freaking show, but you, you got to be, you're, you're paying for it. Like it's, it's the fucking yep. cost of chartering that fucking yacht. It's prorated down slightly. They say it's a discount, but my math does not have a fucking discount in there. <laughs> I'm like what where's our fucking discount you're supposed to be able to bring 12 people you're only allowed to bring six because they have their crew in the other fucking room so shouldn't only half the price then it's, it ain't half the price motherfucker um <laughs> I, i'll tell you what though man it, it, it timed up i already had a european vacation set with my with my um my kids we we're gonna go away for three weeks i i canceled london put us in sardinia italy we went a week earlier uh, it, and, and it, it was an overall cool experience. My episode just aired this past May 8th and, and Monday, May 15th. Uh, and, and here's the thing, man, with these reality shows now, it, it lives there forever, man. Who gives a fuck when it premieres? <laughs> like, like it's in on demand and you know, the streaming, the streaming world forever. And, uh, I, I was, I was kidding with Johnny before I brought him on that they, they, when I said, well, I'm not familiar with this show. I had seen it. It is an interesting, it's kind of one of those things when you're flipping through the channels, hey, you kind of get stuck watching it. You like it. Um, and they, they name dropped Johnny for, for sure to, to me when they were assuring me that we don't make people look bad because again, you're paying for it. You got to do their location. They're got to do their dates. Oh, and by the way, we only giving you a two months notice to put this shit together. Oh, and also, by the way, we're going to film every move you fucking make. Okay. Like, like, <laughs> all right. It, it's, uh, there's a lot of people that aren't going to sign up for that. So what, what's your story, man? How did you end up on it? We ended up on it because of all the other shows that I done, Okay, uh, you, you know, the industry, uh, they reach out to everybody and, we thought it was a uh, great idea. And my wife's saying that's not true. What's the truth? <laughs> oh, actually, okay. You, you okay, actually well, that's you, why you need to be here. You, 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 <laughs> you, well, you bring your wife on if you want. T tell the truth. You, you filled out the application online every week for two years until they picked you. Okay, so uh, we have a uh, <laughs> friend named Pamela who knows the uh, uh, Tracy. Yep. And so they, they reached out to us. We thought about for, for a while. And so I don't even know the truth. My wife wanted to go do it. So I said, okay, I'm going to do what you want to do. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, uh, agreed to do it. We bring three other couples. And like you said, the price, they say it's 250,000 a, a week on the boat. So you cut it in half to 125 and then they cut it in half. So ours was 60. So yeah. every couple had to pay 15 okay. um, grand each and then. Um, the tip was five. So 20 grand, we all would um, be out there. They don't fly you out um, yeah. first class or anything. You have to do all that stuff on your yeah. own. But uh, we had such a great time. And yeah. there's a lot of stuff that they didn't show. Like uh, Joel and I were, uh, when we got off the boat one night, we were racing down the street. And, you know, this is a guy who swims with great white sharks. And so he's a definitely a fit guy. Yeah. And, and we had such a great time the uh, first time. And, um, you know, some incidents happened. You know, someone was talking shit about America and about yeah. Donald. Okay. And, uh, oh, shit. and we, we took offense to it. And he, um, he's like, why is he cutting 
money off to uh, our country and we're like why are we paying your country so <laughs> well, anyways where, where was your, where were you guys at what oh what, shoot what, that, no, what, uh, where, where was the guy yeah on this one it was Mallorca. so okay so i actually told our guests this guy was getting kicked out of this uh uh, burlesque uh, restaurant bar and then I, I told my group let's go inside um, he's being dragged out and he was at the boat next to us so we go inside for a good hour and then you know we wanted to get back outside so all of a sudden he comes walks on our boat and we're like all right this is not your boat go back to your own we have our own friends we're doing our thing and then he starts running his mouth and oh god you know my wife can handle herself so i kind of just let her deal with it until <laughs> it was time to uh to jump in but um at the end of the day that was a great one they yeah um they loved us so much they uh wanted us to go back and had a great time again and you know got stung stung by a jellyfish and uh you know my wife goes so who do you want to have pee on you i was like well i could pee on myself and she goes no out of all of us i was like well of course, I'm gonna pick you, and then put your bunny. And then, uh, your bunny, you put your bunny, the two bunnies. <laughs> I want, I want yeah. Jim and Hank to do it. <laughs> Come on, guys! <laughs> and then, uh, and then all of a sudden, like when, when the show came out, it, it looks like I'm asking the bosun to uh, pee on me. Oh god! And it's like, all right. And then later on, I have no mic on, and we're laying um, at this uh, beach club. Yeah. And I'm laying on Michelle, my wife, and uh, they have me say, "I want you to." pee on me and my mouth wasn't my mouth may have been moving but there was no, nothing on me and i'm like people i'm not a disgusting guy you know it's uh but uh anyways and, and then people got on me because you know i had to go pee i had to uh and i couldn't make it back to our room so i went over the side of the boat and peed kind of like guys do yeah you know, that that's why we have this thing between our legs so we can Go do that wherever you want, and unfortunately, uh, um, camera got me, and people have opinions on everything. And uh, we had a blast. And Captain Sandy comes to my golf tournament every now and then. Um, Aisha came out to the golf tournament. June Bug came out to our event. So we've stayed close to uh, the cast, and they're fantastic. And they want us to go back on and uh we'll, we'll think about it <laughs> but uh <laughs> um i'm i'm just super busy now you know with the uh my a-game drink i've been traveling trying to get us into a lot of locations and uh yeah so everything's great okay well here i want to actually want to ask you about that briefly too but 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 real real quickly for, first of all the forty five <laughs> you paid mine was a little bit higher than that that i think but 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 the bigger problem for me I didn't have people that like, oh, because I'm bringing my girlfriend at the time. We're broken up now, but bringing my girlfriend at the time. Nothing like watching it a year later, by the way, when your right, girlfriend's yeah. on it with you, you're not even fucking together anymore. Hey, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one yeah. for sure. And but, and her new boyfriend's probably like, you went on a boat wigs, yeah. this crazy guy. Okay. Yeah. I got to I got to compete against this guy. <laughs> no, dude, knowing her, she's probably like, watch this motherfucker. That's what he used to do for me. Uh, <laughs> Um, but like I brought, my, I decided to bring my kids because we already had the other shit. So obviously, I can't have my kids chip in. I we, we did bring one other couple, and and they they chipped in for gratuity, and they're they're financially well off. They they could have definitely split in, but I just didn't think it was appropriate. Hey, this might be my kids going. I, I just would love to have you guys on with it. So so overall, it ended up cost, cost, costing me a bit more. But I got to tell you, man, it was it was fucking worth it, man. I mean, it's cool. And then watching it on TV this past week, getting to like relive half the shit. You know what I mean? absolutely we'll definitely pay attention yeah. this week i think we'll yeah we're, we might be on an airplane so hopefully they have all the channels yeah well it, you know you said something about the so I, i'm on instagram with all of our i was with captain glenn and my ca staff is like daisy and gary it's it's blow duck sailing it's the it's the sailing one and i i, I gotta tell you i'm on instagram with all these fucking people well this one girl comes on there on, off camera i thought she was like my friend on this shit she's like He's giving me high school douchebag vibes. She says to the fucking camera about me and <laughs> fucking, I fucking unfollowed her ass on Instagram, bro. Fuck that shit. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, uh, 
that's people's opinion. They think yeah. they can say anything about everyone and you're just living your best life yeah. and you, you should be able to do whatever you want. You're the one who paid for it. Like what? if she paid for it, you can calm down. But Bro. yeah, there's trolls at everywhere, buddy. Well, here, here, here's what's fucked up about it, dude. So they, of course, they put this in the season trailer. So what you were just saying about the voiceover with the pissing and stuff, it wasn't quite that bad. But we're on this thing for 10 minutes. My daughter is is a teenager she's trying to put it on her snapchat story dad say something funny to my friends on snapchat i'm on a yacht i go i'm on a yacht motherfucker look at my chain bitch like to her friends being kidding <laughs> the fucking cameras catch me across the fucking boat zoom in on me like i'm fucking saying it to bravo so bravo season fucking premiere i'm saying it to my daughter i thought was privately in their fucking <laughs> season trailer wow i'm on a yacht motherfucker look at my chain bitch i mean it's actually kind of funny well, yeah, the second episode we were on, I told everybody that I was super tired yep. and I would like to go to bed. And they're like, no, this is our last night. So here I am dozing at dinner and everyone just thinks that I'm fucked up. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was having a lot of beers, but guess what? Two of the uh, crewmates kept drinking the beers that were in the uh, coolers for us. And I, and I was like, why do we have warm beer? Yep. And then. In yep. the show, they show these guys like drinking a little bit. I was like, oh, now yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking funny. That's funny. Well, hey, man, we're, we're, we're going to end it on this, but let's end it on a business note, brother. Uh, you, did, did I hear you mention that you're involved in, in, an, in an energy drink, did you say? Uh, it's a clean hydration drink. It's called okay. A-Game. You got to bring your A-Game for everything you do, whether we're doing a podcast, being, being a parent, being a teacher, um, so playing sports. Um, yeah, yeah. So I am, um, greatly involved. Um, I just brought Bo Jackson, um, on our board. Awesome. Uh, we also have Tyler Adams, the U S national soccer captain. And, uh, we can't, we can't wait for the world cup to come to the uh, States in a couple more years from now. So we have a strong team. We have Ryan Cabrera. Uh, we're adding a few more, um, influencers, like call them now. And, yep. uh, yeah, and we're in a lot of stores. Uh, we're in Publix in the southeast, in the northeast. We're in Shaw, Stop and Shop, uh, Giant, Giant Eagle. Um, I believe we have a meeting with Kroger soon, CVS, and we're in uh, convenience stores over in Arizona. And uh, we're just going out there. And the best thing about us, we taste great. And a lot of drinks can't say that because I want to put my name on something that tastes like shit. That's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. And you remember, you probably know his name, Darren Rovell. He used to be, a, he's on Action yep. Sports now, he used to be on ESPN. I'm in a couple of venture deals with him, and he said it best on our show once, Johnny. He said, you know, it's, it's 1% of it. 1% of it is that the product better be fucking good for beverages. That's 1%. The other 99% is being able to navigate the system to get it on fucking store shelves. Oh, know? absolutely. And I've been uh, traveling a lot and doing it, and things, are looking up for us. Um, Good. like we get our hide, we get our hydration from sea salt. We get our, uh, um, sugars from honey and, uh, we have Icelandic water and, uh, yeah. And it's great tasting. And, uh, we had to come out with a zero brand because I support Mr. Olympia. Um, we, we've been supporting some of these, uh, championship pickleball events. We've, uh, um, yeah, we're going after some NIL, um, athletes and so yeah we're we hopefully we'll start rocking and rolling i know it's a process but yeah we do taste great and like i said everyone always has to bring the reggae awesome awesome all right i'm gonna let johnny off the hook with our final question it's usually about his favorite movie but we spoke so much about Moneyball already and he's he's given us well do you, do you have a movie you recommend to our audience oh man there's there's yeah. so many i mean <laughs> I mean, Mark Wahlberg's great at everything. Kevin yeah. Costner. I mean, uh, what they do is trem tremendous. Uh, you know, a lot of Kevin Costner's movies uh, make me cry, whether it's uh, um, Draft Day or whether it's yes, uh, um, uh, Field of Dreams. So uh, he definitely uh, gets me in that mood. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love Dances with Wolves, too. If you have, I didn't walk oh. for about 20 years. I watched it the other day. I was like, dude, that's good shit. So, oh, anyway. absolutely. And that wraps up another episode of 2000% Raise. Thank you for listening. The best way to support our show is by leaving a rating or review on all platforms you listened on. And of course, by following, liking, or subscribing. 
Visit us at 2000percentraise.com or at John Sarasani on TikTok and Instagram. And of course, my YouTube channel at John Sarasani's 2000% Raise. Find all the ways to follow today's guests in our show notes. Thank you for being a part of our entrepreneurial journey.